And that's the that's that's the kind of thing that we're trying to focus on. Very good. Joe, okay, I've well, the should we start? Yeah, Jazz, I'm still or? working with George to see if he can at least oh, see. Okay. The you go ahead. Okay. So um how many people do we have here? I only see three. Well, actually, my uh, my yeah, thumbnails with the screen I'm working with, I don't get a good picture. You see but, the captions. Um, okay. The words. So we'll start now, and I'll just say hello, everybody. Um, frustrating. I, I, I just heard frustrating, so that's that's a good thing. That's because we're still having an audio problem with George. He. We can hear oh. him, but he can't hear us. Oh, that is we're frustrating. We have to schedule a separate Zoom meeting to see what's going on with his microphone. Oh, okay. And who else do we have with us today? Barbara Gibson. Hello. Nick. Hmm? I heard Barbara Gibson. Uh, and uh, I said hello. Um, uh, hello, Barb. I missed the uh, first session of this, uh, part one in getting hearing aids, um, but it's a, a topic that I really need to know more about, even though I have hearing aids now. Uh, so I am glad to uh, be present for the next session. Oh, oh okay. great. Can I interrupt, mm -hmm. Joe? Go ahead. Barb, I just wanna remind people that all of these sessions are being recorded. Yeah. And can go to our chapter website and click on the videos button it will take you where part one is recorded it'll be all the way at the bottom of the list yeah thank you Chess. okay so art so you know i am timing this talk i'm using the stopwatch feature okay, good. Good. and i'm shooting for 45 minutes i don't know how successful i'll be with it I guess on a clock here, Joe, so we'll Okay, <laughs> it's well-timed. <laughs> All right, so hello, everybody. Um, is there anybody here for the first time? Now, George, can you hear, can you, can you hear us? You can read the caption, maybe. Yeah, I could read the captions, but I can't hear you. Okay, so this is your first time, is this correct? Have you been with us before? Yeah, I've been. Uh, okay. I've been at well, another meeting, but uh, I couldn't hear that either. Oh, my goodness. Um, are you a current hearing aid user? Yes, I am. Okay, and how long have you had your hearing aids? A couple of years. Okay. Um, after we get through most of this, I'm talking slower so that the captions can keep up. Um, then perhaps we can exchange emails and I can get a better feel for where you're at, if you'd like to do that, so. Does that sound okay? It sounds great. All right, great. So this is part two and uh, we'll start. And I think I'm moving on to slide two. And in review of what we talked about last time, hearing aids we said are not simple items as many people think. More demands are placed on your hearing aids than possibly any other body-borne or portable listening device. They are processing sounds in a wide variety of unrestricted acoustic environments in real time without the benefit of an audio engineer or any third party and with a very, very limited power supply. Hearing aid acquisition, too, is not a straightforward matter. Without the assistance of a knowledgeable third party, outcomes may be in doubt. 
Uh, most problems, however, are simple and inexpensive issues, which are easily resolved with minimal, if any expense, with the assistance from a hearing professional. Um, what we're gonna talk about today is an overview of the audiogram. This will take some time. This is fairly complex. Um, some of the difficult hearing losses, we'll do more of that next session. And this is the heart of today's talk, and that's reasonable expectations, okay? Um, and what you should expect from your hearing aids. And we're gonna talk a little bit about getting used to hearing aids. We'll do more of that next uh, session. So that's our agenda for today. We'll start with the audiogram. See here, there's an awful lot of information on this sheet of paper. We have, starting from the left, the pure tone averages. The pure tone averages are an excellent indicator of the severity, overall severity of your hearing loss. In this case, this gentleman's pure tone averages are 49 decibels bilaterally. So that would be right about here as his overall average, okay? The averages consist of the frequencies of 500, 1000, 2000, and 4,000. These are considered to be the critical, the critical frequency range for understanding speech. It used to be 500, 1,000, and 2,000, and 4,000 wasn't included. But now we realize that 4,000 is critical for hearing in noise. And so now this is probably what almost all providers use is the four frequency average. Now, if you look down at the bottom here of this box on, on uh, 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 pure tone averages, you'll see there's a lot of information here. These are the results we got for last year. And the one down below that is the year when he first came in. So we keep track, we kept track, and this is unusual, of the first result and the last one we had, and then today's result. The reason for that is we learned that often we're just looking at this and we're not taking into account that we had all these other history here and we would forget what the patient started with. Um, this box here, I may be getting ahead of myself a, a little bit, uh, sound field, and I think I am, and I think we'll cover that in the next slide or two. Over here is the legend. Over here is the scores for speech audiometry. Um, I don't have anything here with tympanometry. And you'll see that there was an ear check and this person's ears were clear. Go to the next slide. Here's a closer look at this audiogram, okay? There's a lot of information here. Once again, these are the speech frequencies. And these Cs stand for um, where does the patient hear the speech stimulus when he's got hearing aids in the sound treated room? In this case, it's always center, except at 4,000, where for some reason it lateralizes to the right. Um, the circles are under the earphones. The X's um, for the right ear. The X's are for the left ear. You can see his ears are very, very close. The B stands for the amount of benefit he got from both ears. Don't think of that as benefit, the improvement. Over here, the S's is the unaided scores. So he, he's sitting in a sound field, a special room without hearing aids, and we took his threshold. In this instance, they match nicely with his audiogram. They never match perfectly. There's always a variation and lots of reasons for it we don't need to go into. 
But by looking at this, you can see that here, this fellow gains 10, 20, 30 decibels improvement at 2000 Hertz. And here he gains 10, 20, 25 decibels gain at 3000 and at 4000, 10, 20, 30. This is considered to be a quite good outcome. Normally you'll see 30 to 35 decibels improvement. These are all the various sounds of speech, the voice sounds. And you can see that he hears many of the voice sounds without his hearing aid at the average conversational level. But he's not going to hear the F, S, T, H, T, and the K without some help. Or the, these sounds here, the P, the H, the G, CH, and SH. However, with his hearing aids, he gets them. Now, if somebody were to use who was speaking with him a slightly stronger voice, that would bring all these scores down to um, uh, within his range of audibility. So he's getting a lot of benefit from his hearing aid. Um, let's see if I left anything off. I don't think so. I, th I think we've covered it all pretty well. Every audiogram has a legend or a, a, another term. And these are all the symbols and it's on your audiogram. And so you can see what your scores mean in comparison to, you understand it by looking at the legend. Now here's more on the pure tone averages where I got ahead of myself a little bit. So you can see SF is sound field. And I have two scores here. One is for the uh, um, one is for the uh, um, uh, the typical uh, three frequency average, and this is the four frequency average. And they're called out here two, three, and four. Oh, I, I revise that. He doesn't include that to five hundred. You see the gain, the score. You see the aided gain. So this allows us to quantify how much help the individual is receiving. Now, the critical aspect, though, is how well do they understand speech with their hearing aids? And you can see at a very high level, without hearing aids, this individual gets 92 and 96 percent. And we did it high to make sure we en encompassed all of the speech sounds that were audible to this person. At the average conversational level though, look, he scored 96%. That's a big deal. There's a huge difference between 50 and 80 dB. Down here, we measured what's most comfortable for him and what's his level of discomfort. Because we need to make sure that his hearing aid is fully within his comfortable range of hearing. And we were able to verify what that is. So this is just a review again of all those things that we talked about. Um, the pure tone averages, the actual scores, the legend, the speech recognition score, and the most comfortable and uncomfortable listening levels. And over here is the aided scores. So an audiogram can contain an awful lot of information. Not many of the uh, them contain all this, but this is what we used. And it can be a little hard to find your way around because sometimes the pure tone averages are abbreviated differently as PTA as we did or Air conduction, the pure tone average, and bone conduction, pure tone average. Air conduction means the results for the earphone over the ear, and that measures the entire auditory system. Bone conduction, you may remember, was a vibrator in the back of the skull, back of your ear. And that measures just from the, the, the cochlea into the, uh, the auditory system. And the difference between them tells you something about the integrity of the middle ear. Um, it may be necessary to look around a little bit to find all these different values and understand the designations. 
because everybody uses a different term, not terribly well standardized. Now, the heart of this is about getting hearing aids. This is what we're here to talk about. And the number one rule, and we're going to repeat this later on, is do not respond to ads or claims or phone calls. That's just, this is not a good way to go, especially the ones promoting the national experts. A good idea to avoid that. And the, these ads sometimes are just fantastic. And they're really done by good ad, good ad agencies. But that's on a national level. And on the local level, there can be quite a disconnect between the quality of the ad and unfortunately, the providers we may encounter. The new insurance plans don't help matters very much. We can talk about that later if somebody has questions. Um, often, they don't fully understand the complexities involved. And so they select lesser grade hearing aids, sometimes very inferior devices. And often there are very few follow-up visits included. It's my sense that the hearing aid benefit plans appear to be based on a poor or simplistic understanding of the actual needs of the recipients and the nature of and complexities of uh, hearing aid and hearing losses. Once again, avoid advertisements claiming hearing aid breakthrough or other claims. There are no technology breakthroughs. It just doesn't happen. Um, instead, any breakthroughs occur in small increments from generation of device to generation of device. And now there's so much going on in the hearing aids. I always wonder how the providers can evaluate all these different features. I knew I never could. You know, some hearing aids will have 20 channels. Well, how do I evaluate the difference between 10 channels and 20 channels? I can't do that. Or there is just noise management feature. How am I going to ever evaluate that in a clinical setting? I, I just, it just can't be done. Um, and oh, here's a good one. Avoid the, uh, the specials. Literally, there is no such thing as 50% off. It just doesn't happen. That is the suggested retail price, uh, which is a price that no one ever charges and no one ever pays. There is no such thing as 50% off or 20% off. It just doesn't happen, okay? Of all of the important things, the number one rule is that the provider is the most important factor. It's really not the hearing aid. It's not the technology. It's knowing what to do with it that matters. And once again, in review, keep in mind good ads, I mean, good advertising agencies. If you're looking at ads, look for the soft, they are called high line ads. They're your safest bet. They don't make any claims about the products. They just say, we're here. Your life is likely to be better with a hearing aid. Uh, if you're looking for a source of providers, a really good source is the Rochester chapter, if you're in this area, of our newsletter. In the back of each newsletter, there are ads from a number of different providers, all of whom um, wouldn't be there if we didn't think they were qualified and good providers. And, this is critically important now when you're thinking about getting hearing aids um, online or over the counter. Keep in mind that with the help of a third party, satisfaction has only been 50 to 70% over the years. It's edging up a little bit with some of the better products. And we all know of somebody who has hearing aids in the drawer. And this too has been improving. Now it's about 30, uh, 10 to 30%. It's hard to really pin that number down. As we said, this is always with assistance from a professional provider. Um, there was a study that was done recently 
that showed that only 30 to 50% of users who bought their hearing aids over the counter or online or through the mail were satisfied with them. And most of the time, these things are due to simple problems. Um, the problems with getting it in your ear properly, wax, maintenance, use of the controls and features, simple things, which of course the users can't appreciate when they're first starting out. Um, as we say, while there's many reasons why hearing aids don't work, the primary reasons are most always user-based problems. They don't understand what the issues are. Simple confusions, failure to understand um, the controls and the features. I, uh, I have relatives who've gone for years and never used a volume control or the program selector. Twisting of the thin wire or tubing, using in the wrong ear, that happens, or putting, even putting the batteries in backwards, simple things, which your, which your provider can help you with. And frequently there's an expectation of studio grade performance. That's not gonna happen with a hearing aid, and we'll talk more about that in the future. Um, and of course, it's very difficult for users to separate minor problems from major problems. And then finally, I, it's been my sense that it seems that people expect to have problems with their hearing aids, and so they do. So they just say that's the way they are, instead of trying to get them resolved. Um, so as we talk about over-the-counter online orders or mail order hearing aids, uh, somebody in one of our hope sessions made the point, and I think it was so good, it boils down to how much are you willing to risk for your hearing aids? How much money? It may be that you will be the exception, but that's terribly hard to predict. One of the reasons is there is a large, unpredictable, interactive effect sometimes between the user, the hearing loss, and the hearing aid. <clears throat> you can't count on putting on a hearing aid and walking out the door and being adept with it. It rarely happens. If you get a hearing aid without the help of a professional, even with a professional, it's critical to exercise due diligence and perseverance in order to make sure that your situation is optimized. What did I do? Um, And if you get your hearing aids from a local situation, make sure that um, they do a word recognition test. Without a word recognition test, you do not have all of the critical components necessary to understand and know how you do with your hearing aids. Um, you may be wondering, where do I turn to for, device, uh, for support? Well, of course, our chapter is a wonderful source for that. And we have our hope sessions once a month. Right now they're Zoom. Uh, check the uh, website for when we're having them. It's usually the uh, day following the regular program meeting, Wednesdays. Um, anybody can join, ask your questions, discuss your experiences, get input from other users and from a provider, a former provider, that's me. Um, we're gonna be having future Zoom sessions on getting hearing aids. And so just uh, think about you know, coming back and visiting this again. If you have a severe hearing loss and you're deaf, check the Rochester Recreation Club for the deaf, or you can go online or Facebook perhaps. Um, According to one expert, proper hearing aid fitting requires two and a half hours. Our practice really used closer to three hours. This was when things went well, and we incorporated an active follow-up procedure. That means that we always sought to learn how the patient did with their hearing aids or any adjustments that we made. We would do that by having them come for a return visit, or we would initiate a follow-up call or email to learn of their outcome. If they needed more contacts, 
they, they were available. People did not have to wait two weeks or three weeks to come back in for a follow-up appointment. And we always included a six month follow-up. This would be a quickie thing. It was a cheap visit, maybe $15, inexpensive. And a reevaluation and hearing aid check in one year. You'll see later on how effective that was. Um, this section is, is gonna provide you ideas of how to evaluate your hearing aid fitting. And provide you with reasonable expectations based on the reports of a large number of people in our practice. And it consists of about 900, probably if you stretch it, I'll bet you a thousand, short-term users. This is, we asked how they were doing and we took a comprehensive inventory six to eight weeks after their fitting. Well, they were still in the honeymoon period. I was taught, told that um, the honeymoon period lasts four months. And then we looked at 250 long-term users, which were 12 through 36 months post hearing aid fitting. Generally, we would do this um, every two years, but not always. Sometimes we didn't get around to it. If you have a busy practice, it's really hard to squeeze this kind of task into it sometimes. Um, and that provided us a good indication as to how well people were doing well beyond their honeymoon period. The approach, this approach resulted in very high rates of success and satisfaction. Initially, we only asked about success. And we learned that our success rate was 97%. I mean, this was these were high rankings too. Uh, that's incredible. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at that. Satisfaction, and this almost always helped, was always a little bit lower than, nine, than, uh, than success. You know, and here's the reason you can think of it. If you buy a car to get to work in, you can get an old clunker and that will get you to work every day. But it's not a very satisfying experience, right? But if you get a nice new car, <clears throat> it's comfortable and is warm and it, what have you, then you have a level of satisfaction that you don't have with just the success. And this is compared to the national rates of satisfaction, 50 to 70%. So that just gives you an idea that a good follow-up program um, makes a big difference. Um, twice, we had results verified by attorneys, once in 1998 and, and once in 2008. So that's information you can pretty much take to the bank. The conclusion was that we came up with, so hearing aids do work when the issues and problems are followed up. So what should you expect when you get a hearing aid and what should you not have problems with? First of all, there's a number of items, and I like this section a lot, and this is something else you can take to the bank. There are some things that are under total control of the provider. Feedback, whistling and squealing. Your hearing aids should not be whistling and squealing. That's not as much of a problem now as it was in the past, but it still can be an issue. A need to turn the volume up and down excessively. That too is not as much of a problem as it was. With, with today's new equipment. Floor noise, and by that I mean hissing, a rushing sound, similar to when the volume is turned up on your stereo, but there's nothing playing, you hear that hissing, that's floor noise. Every electronic instrument has floor noise. Um, compression sounds. This too is not as much of an issue as it used to be, but who knows how it's gonna be with the less expensive hearing aids. And they were heard as a whooshing or a swishing or a pumping sound of certain sounds of speech. I think that's been pretty much solved. But if you're running into that, you shouldn't have that issue. There should be no distortion. They should be clear. You shouldn't have 
fuzzy, splattery sounds and poor sound quality. They should not be unreliable. And here's a big one. And I know that Eric will go along with this. Discomfort. You should never have ear pain. You should never have trouble maintaining your keeping your hearing aid in your ear. And you here's a this is a big one. The biggest separator we found was uh, from irritation from loud and sharp sounds like this, or a, a fork going down on a table, or a bowl, in, or a one plate on another. Those were the sounds that people really found offensive. And there's no need for them. Now, modern hearing aids have this totally under control. If you don't, if you're having a problem with it, then you've got a major issue. That was the very first thing we looked at whenever any of the uh, 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 manufacturer reps came into the office. We listened to how sharp the hearing aid was. If it was sharp, that was the end of our visit pretty much. Um, we found that, as I said, that was a primary separator between the different hearing aids. Background noise, um, that can be hard to control. You're always gonna have some level of background noise. Now, at home though, that's good because there you have near total control over your background noise. Um, sometimes interference by, by other sounds and loud voices are hard to control. Remember, your microphone is always gonna pick up the loudest and the closest thing the best. Hardcore noise, like at restaurants and weddings and sporting events. Cocktail party, sure. It's all getting better. Every time there's a, a new generation comes out, it's a little bit better, but it's still uh, intensity prevails and it can be very, very difficult to overcome. Um, and once again, there is no studio grade performance and maintenance issues, meaning wax and batteries and, and, and just taking good care of the hearing aids. And hearing at a distance. Hearing loss limits effective listening distance. The greater the hearing loss, the closer you need to be to what you're listening to. And while that's very true with hearing aids and hearing loss, with hearing aids, you should have a greater effective listening distance, but it will never approach normal. It just is impossible. What, what can you expect? And this is, this is the crux of this whole thing here. There's a gold standard that we came up with. We found this to always, always be the case. You should always expect to hear well and clearly and quiet. In one-to-one -one situations or a small group, there's no background noise. And if you're relatively close to the individual or individuals you're listening to, it should be clear and you should not have an issue hearing. Um, this is regardless of the technology. We found this with the cheapest thing we could, we came across and the most expensive. In quiet, hearing aids work pretty well. Now, uh, the caveat here is that it's easy to make sounds louder and that's why inexpensive devices will work but it's not easy to make them louder, but not too loud. And here's where all the technology is, is in managing the loudness growth of the sounds that are presented to the ear. You should always have good hearing around the home in general. Again, remember that uh, you have control over the sounds in your home. Uh, hearing the spouse or other communication partners, you should be able to hear them better. The TV should be better, much better. Um, and you can easily evaluate that. Take your hearing aid off and, and, and set the TV to your comfortable listening level. Note the, the level of the volume control and make sure it's the level, not where you just hear it and understand it, but where it's easy, where you don't have to work at it. And then try it with your hearing aids. It's very easy to compare that and get a good quantification of your benefit with a hearing aid. 
almost always people hear natural sounds better. Birds, crickets, leaves, this kind of thing. And mechanical sounds. Uh, sometimes you hear them too good. But you know what? Most of the time you get used to them. Professional offices, doctor's offices, they're usually much better with hearing aids. At table games, cards, that kind of thing. Um, usually men's voices come in better. It depends on the type of hearing loss you have. Individuals with a low frequency hearing loss hear women better than men. But most hearing losses are high frequency. Um, small group meetings should always be able to hear pretty well in those situations. If you're not, you go back to your provider. You should have that fixed. Well, these others, they're all over the place, in the stores, in the car, in general background noise, at restaurants, at worship, uh, performances, meetings. Uh, it depends on your hearing, your hearing loss, and critically, especially for worship and performances, where you are seated, okay? If you're one of the individuals that likes to sit in the back at worship, well, you're probably not going to hear well unless there's an assistive device there, such as an induction loop. Um, you can affect that, but I know people hate to change their, their seating in their, their place of worship. Um, so then they struggle. And that's, that's, a, that's a conscious trade-off that you're making. Remember, hearing loss decreases listening distance. Um, hearing from room to room, that's always tough. You can't do it. It can't be done. And everyone comes in and complains about it. But the reason that continues to be a problem is because when the other party says something to you, it always works with everybody else. It's just that those of us with hearing loss, we're the exception. So that hasn't become habituated. Unexpected comments or questions. That's another tough one. You're sitting there reading a book or absorbed in a puzzle or something and somebody says something to you, you're not gonna get it. Sometimes if you take a moment, you can process it, but those are difficult things. And we always asked about them virtually because that we, the only solution was to counsel the parties involved. Soft voices are tough. Young children, they are almost impossible. I learned to always have an interpreter handy i.e. somebody with good hearing to help me to understand what the child was saying. Now my grandchildren are getting older, it's less of a problem. And it's wonderful when they reach that stage. What you have to do then is slow them down because then they talk too fast. When you're in a noise environment, perhaps in the wind. Um, background noise, it's always gonna be there. You can't get rid of it. Um, Short-term users are very much less bothered by background noise. Long-term users are very much bothered by it. And the reason is, is that your short-term users are just happy because they're hearing so much better, even though they hear the noise better, which is to be expected. Long-term users now are focusing more on the unpleasantness of what they're hearing rather than how much better they're hearing. And both groups report that without their hearing aids in noise, they wouldn't hear anything. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're listening to uh, situations in background noise. Of course, it's going to be louder. Your, your hearing aid amplifies everything. Well, you should be able to hear voices better. Now, who's a good candidate for hearing aid? Here's an ideal candidate for even an over-the-counter, perhaps. Um, you can look at this audiogram, it's nice, and it's a steady progression. So if you were to give somebody maybe 10 or, or 20 decibels benefit here, they're going to be much better off and well into the uh, range of good audibility. And these critical frequencies, especially 2000, which is worth 33% for understanding what's being said, will come into play and provide a great deal of benefit. And along with the natural redundancies of speech, um, should be able to do pretty well. Here's mine. And you can see that 
I'm fortunate. I've got a really good island of, of good hearing here at 1,000. But my highs are down a lot. At 2,000, 33%, and at 4,000, all the way down to, to 65 decibels. So I'm missing a lot of these high-frequency consonants without amplification. With amplification, I'll get maybe 30 dB. I'm just a typical user. Do I get them all? No. Is it a lot better? Yes. So it's definitely worth my while to use the hearing aids. Without them at home, I'm pretty much very handicapped um, around the house, especially my wife's got a softer voice. It's a female voice. It's in a higher pitch range, all of those things. So talking about getting hearing aids again, they're a lot more complicated than initially meet the eye. And it's best to involve other family members or communication partners. They've got to be a part of the process. They too need to learn about the hearing aids and what hearing aids can do and what they can't do. And they need to assist a new user uh, to, to get an idea of what's involved because nobody knows your situation better than your, your partner or your best friend or um, someone who's close to you. And this is something that was, was, was brought clearly to us by one of our members here who's, who's here to, uh, with us today. In some instances, the others are more affected by the hearing loss than the actual user. And that's easy to understand because it user always hears once the other party turns it up, you know, uh, talks louder, repeats themselves, uses a different word, gets closer. And then the user is saying, well, if you spoke like that in the first time, I wouldn't have a problem. That's true. But people don't realize how much work the other party's doing so that they can communicate with you. Um, and also keep in mind, if somebody's suggesting you've got a hearing loss, you probably do. Because people don't go around pointing about other people, pointing out other people's problems if it doesn't affect them. <clears throat> so if your communication partner suggests you're receiving benefit, you probably do. Uh, and especially for folks with high frequency hearing losses. So the limiting factors for success with hearing aids are the configuration, reduced word recognition. If your word clarity is not good, you're going to have a hard time uh, uh, being fully satisfied with your hearing aid. Sound tolerance, older neurology, older folks, there's slower neural transmission times. And the impulses kind of break down. You'll see in the next talk that uh, how many way stations there are, um, loss of neural redundancies, and so on. It takes more time to perceive what's being heard. And we've all experienced that. You don't get it right away, but a moment later, it all comes together. It takes longer to get that vortex. And then, of course, in terms of hearing aid use, there's always uh, issues with, uh, with manual dexterity and uh, vision motivation, anatomical considerations, what have you. What can hearing aids do? We can improve loudness. We can improve clarity. We can improve your voice quality. That can be a real problem at first. That can always be managed. Comfort, they should always be comfortable. Uh, they should, there should not be any distortion. You should have good hearing and quiet. And they're, are, they are more functional in noise, even though you may not like the noise. And most people report that they hear better in noise with your hearing aids than without. Importance of active follow-up, we've spoken about that. Make sure that you have a responsibility and make sure that you're exercising your responsibility as well as your provider. Lots of uh, providers use a passive follow-up model. That's not just hearing aids. It's so many health-related and, and medical issues. Let us know if you're having a problem. We'll see you, we'll be glad to see you. So it's really up to you. Problem is users often don't know 
what they should put up with and what they shouldn't. Well, be satisfied, find out. Um, and while you're in trial period, make sure your issues are resolved. And keep in mind that some of the insurance plans which offer hearing aid benefits, they're not the greatest benefits going. Uh, usually hearing aids are warranted for at least one year by the manufacturer or longer for the higher end, maybe up to three years. So if you don't have a franchise device, you can travel anywhere. So you can go down to Florida for the winter like we do and go to, into any, well, I go to Oda, I go to Oticon. I can go into any Oticon office, have my hearing aid service. Usually it's free. Um, and this is good for three years for the higher end product. Uh, if you can, I think you want a bundled service versus unbundled. By bundled, I mean that all the services for the first year or two are covered um, in uh, the cost of your hearing aid. If it's unbundled, you have to pay every time you go into the office. There is greater cost, but you have a greater ease of mind. And as we've said, it's very unpredictable. You never know who's going to do well and who's going to have a lot of trouble. And keep in mind that hearing aids are not simple listening devices. Ask about loss damage insurance if you're concerned about it. We never recommend it, rarely recommend it because it's an additional expense. Few people lose their hearing aids. Some people are more loss prone than others. And if you think your patient is, you can even ask them um, if they are loss prone, then you should, insurance should be considered. Always seek a six month, a quick check and reevaluate your, re -evalu your hearing aid check after one year. Stay in touch with a provider. Uh, some issues that are always gonna be there, Hardcore noise, restaurants, weddings, parties, sporting events, et cetera. So your hearing aid can't cope with those things well. So you need to develop strategies or think in terms of additional helpful devices. And we have an assistive device uh, uh, program and that happens on the uh, third Thursday of each month. And you can contact this program for your, your questions and advice. When you're buying a hearing aid, you always want to get a volume control. A lot of providers resist this, thinking that you don't need that any longer. But I don't think there's any experienced users that attend HLAA that don't think a volume control is a good thing. Get a T-coil. You're not going to need it right away. It's a minor cost, but it's a big advantage at times, like at worship or other places. And of course, you always, nowadays, you get multiple uh, programs and you want Bluetooth with your hearing aid. In terms of getting used to background noise, keep in mind that if it's too loud and the sounds hurt your ears, you're not going to get used to that. They are not going to adapt to loud sounds. You get used to background noise, but you don't get used to loud sounds. And annoyance from environmental background noise, like I say, you can adapt to that. The refrigerator, the traffic noise, household noises, and so on. Now we're gonna kind of close with a discussion of where you can go to get hearing aids if you're not going online or um, over the counter. There are two sectors that provide hearing aids. There are commercial providers and health related. Uh, uh, providers. Commercial sector in New York State has two years of college courses plus training courses. And the professional sector, an eight-year program of college and graduate school. Um, all things being equal, weigh the credentials of your provider carefully. It's hard to find a provider. Ask around. Ask anybody you see who's got a hearing aid or you know, how do you like your hearing aid? Is it working for you? Blah, blah, blah. Ask all the questions. Ask where they went, how many times you were seen, and if they don't mind sharing, how much did you pay? However, if you're happy with your current provider, by all means, stay with them. 
and, and keep in mind about the importance of your, your follow-up. Um, we've already talked about this and we've already, yeah, we may not realize that becoming an audiologist costs hundred to $200,000. Um, and anybody who is an audiologist, they go into this wanting to help people or an interest in science and the, and the helping aspect of it. Um, they don't go into it as a sales income in terms of sales. On the other hand, the, uh, the hearing instrument specialist usually is a sales profession. And I think people back into that after a while. Uh, it only takes two years of college credit and the attendance perhaps at a three to a five day seminar in order to become qualified to take your examination. And uh, here's some uh, material that uh, came from an ad in a trade magazine, pass your examinations in five days, three days, or even just buy some DVDs. Now, in terms of resources, knowing that hearing aids are expensive, uh, some really good resources are the Finger Lakes Region Lions Hearing Foundation. That's a lot of words and it always gets mixed up. So I'll say it again. Finger Lakes Region. That's one, one section. Lions Hearing Foundation. You can look it up online. There's applications there. Or you can contact your local service club. Or you can contact Access VR, which is vocational rehabilitation if you're in the workforce or Veterans Administration. And there's other possibilities too. Ask your provider about it. And there's the various insurance plans. So oh, today we covered a lot. Uh, explanation of the audiogram, spent a lot of time with that. Some ideas about getting hearing aids and some things, some good tips about how to evaluate your fitting. Who's a good candidacy? and the importance of follow-up, who's a good candidate, and the importance of follow-up. And we talked about the differences between providers. In our next meeting, we'll <coughs> talk about some of the challenges of the various audiograms. We'll do a brief review of the anatomy of the ear and relationship between some challenging fittings. And we'll talk about the brain mechanisms of adaptation and habituation. I think you'll find that very interesting. And we'll review, and then we'll, of what we, we just talked about, and we'll have an overall review. So that's it. That's today's talk. And uh, I can take any questions. I think I went pretty fast. And if I did go too fast, please let me know. I want to, I want to make this, uh, as easy to follow and understand as I can.